the single most important teaching that I have to pass on in 31 years of recovery from addiction is to simply not sit alone with difficult and painful emotions and to be always willing and in the habit of reaching out to share and connect with others, to share the challenge that you're facing with other caring, compassionate, wise people who are also on the same path you are, which is the path of recovery, the path of awareness, the path of discovery. Thank you, Tommy. I have a question um, about the part of my recovery that really makes my my knees shake. And that's around uh, relapse. And um, I guess it's a relationship between me and me and me and my higher power and uh, myself and my addictive behaviors. And somewhere in there, there's a lack of trust. And I feel like... Um, my addiction is kind of like a boogeyman and it's going to come and get me and take me out. Mm. So I'm kind of wondering, like, can you tell me, uh, share with me some of the signs and especially the not so subtle signs of uh, a relapse mm. in the making? So uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and then we'll, we'll dive in. Uh, when you talk about the word recovery, I just want to be specific for people. So we're talking about recovery from addiction. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, are you comfortable to say what you're what you feel you're in recovery from? Oh, yes, I'm in recovery from uh, opiates and benzodiazepines, uh, cigarettes, and a long time ago, alcohol. Okay, so substances, primarily. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you've been uh, abstinent and in recovery on this path of recovery and discovery for some time? Uh, nine years. Nine years without a relapse. Yes. And so your and I know also that you're involved in helping many, many people and you're a teacher and, and you're a coach and you work with a lot of people in recovery. So I'm guessing that this question about relapse is not just for your own benefit, but for the people that you work with. Yes. Yeah. I feel like there's a, there's a, some mystery around it in terms of what where really are the triggers that are there that, uh, that make it happen. And okay. I feel like I know some of the signs, but I, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm still kind of bewildered. And uh, yeah. Yep. Beautiful. Okay. I welcome any discussion of this concept of relapse. So I'd like to, I'd like to really spend some time with it, uh, specifically on your inquiry, the signs of relapse, also expanding out into a greater understanding of what this thing is and what recovery is in general. I think it's important for people to understand that when we talk about recovery, most people think about I'm recovering from an addiction, meaning what I'm trying to do is to put down the substance or addictive behavior. And that when I put that thing down, uh, I'll be in recovery. And then I'll go through sort of whatever struggles I go through day in and day out to remain either in recovery or to have experience this thing called relapse. And that is a very abstinence-based focus, an abstinence-based way of looking at recovery from addiction. And what I mean by that is, in that perspective, if you, let's say in your case, you spoke about having been an opiate addict. So uh, from that perspective, you were recovered when you put down your th those drugs that class of drugs so you were an opiate addict and then you put down the the opiates and you were no longer an opiate addict and you were in recovery and if you happen to relapse during that time then you'll be back into your addiction as a as a categorization of what's going on with you um, or you'll be in relapse um, and so this is a sort of a way that i think most people think about and it's a very simplistic, a very simplistic way of looking at uh, recovery. The way I'm looking at recovery, abstinence is a necessary first step to be able to actually begin the work of recovery. 
the 12 steps are a program that is formed to help people uh, to release their addictive behavior, to build a, a relationship with a power greater than oneself, to have a spiritual experience take place in a person. Those 12 steps are therefore in helping a person to get to become abstinent and desire to be abstinent, the 12 steps actually behave in a way like a foundation. So I've said before and written that the 12 steps are very beautiful and important, and they are actually the first step. The 12 steps are the first step because they bring you to that abstinent place. And actually they bring you to the, the, to the miracle of actually wanting to be abstinent of not being stuck in craving every day, that beautiful uh, freedom that I can remember experiencing in my own recovery. And I know that you have experienced this as well, that we don't desire to use drugs and alcohol today. It's not like we're white knuckling it and trying to just get through the day. We actually feel that sense of freedom. Something has happened for us that has created a shift and we are abstinent by choice, not by obligation. At first, maybe for me, I was abstinent by obligation. I had to do it because I felt like I was going to die if I didn't. And that's probably not dramatic. That's probably quite accurate. Later on, I'm, I'm, I've made that shift from fear of going back to a, a self-harming behavior, fear of relapsing. I made the shift into love of the life I have as the main reason why I want to continue to move forward on this path not because I'm afraid of going back, but because I'm interested in loving what's happening and wanting to move forward. So if we can understand abstinence as the first step, then we have to ask ourselves, okay, so what actually is recovery? What are we talking about here? We are, for me, we're talking about the establishment of a reconnection with one's authentic self. We're talking about the recovery of one's ability to be authentic in the world. We're talking about certainly the recovery of one's health at the level of body and the level of mind and spirit. We're talking about recovering a sense of purpose and meaning, plugging into something that has weight and, and, and spiritual depth to it. We're, we're in this recovery, not just to become, you know, our, our claim to fame is not I'm, I'm abstinent from alcohol, I'm abstinent from drugs, I'm abstinent from acting out in whatever addictive way I used to. That is a brilliant and beautiful start. And very important. It's the necessary step, we have to become abstinent from the behavior that used to hurt us in order to begin the work of, of establishing freedom and the reconnection and recovery that I'm speaking about. So that recovery of authenticity is at the crux of your question about relapse. You see, relapse begins, in my opinion, on an energetic level, the second that we behave or act out of our authentic truth, when we lose integrity. When we do something that is not in alignment with our heart, I find that to be, on a, in a minor way, a traumatizing and defining event. Whether we caught it or not, in some way, shape, or form, we acted out of alignment or out of our own authenticity. And that's where, in my opinion, relapse begins. We are moving away from our center. We're moving away from our truth. For me, in, in my work of recovery, what I recognize is we must be truthful. We must live in the expression of truth that has become available to us. Each one of us has a relationship with what is true. Uh, the way we would put it in English is what is true for you today? What is true for you? For example, for me, it is true that I don't desire to use cannabis. I don't actually desire it. It's true. If I go out and use cannabis for because I was pressured into it, because I allowed myself to be pressured into it, or 
uh, because I got confused or I lost consciousness for a moment and, and went down a path that was no longer appropriate for me. That would be me stepping away from my truth. And in stepping away from my truth, I would very quickly feel, because I'm attuned to it at this point, I would very quickly feel like I did something wrong. Not wrong. It's not wrong to use cannabis. It's not right to use cannabis. For me, at a certain point in my life, when I was 13 years old, all the way up to 22, I wanted to use cannabis. I loved what it did for me. It was just a beautiful uh, a thing for me in my life. At that time, it was serving me, given the level of awareness and consciousness and what I had available to me. I wanted to engage in cannabis. So you might say, at that time in my life, in some way, uh, give, from my perspective, it was a good choice for me at that time. Little did I know that later on, I would have to pay some prices for that choice um, and my, my dependence upon it. So my, my point here is that if I am dishonest, if I, if I lie, if I act out in ways that are not in accordance with my heart today, I usually feel it. But even if I don't feel it, something has happened there where I have left my center. Now, when people relapse, it doesn't have to be some kind of tragedy. In my opinion, it should never be a source of shame, as I know people feel so ashamed when they relapse. Um, and I, can, I understand the humanness of that. But from the outside, there's nothing shameful about it. Relapse is nothing more than a return to a previous level of consciousness in which a self-harming behavior takes place. So in recovery, I've, let's say I've come to a place of greater truth and centeredness. I feel good about being here. Um, I've elevated myself, my frequency, my vibration, my, my consciousness. And I'm in this consciousness of health and wellness and, and recovery, love and connection. Feels really, really good to me. Let's say circumstances take place in my life and I, I allow some negativity in and I fall back into a self-harming behavior. That's just a return to a previous level of consciousness. And if I catch it, which of course, when you relapse, usually there's pain that comes along with it. You catch it and you can say, wow, this doesn't feel good. This didn't seem to solve the problem. This wasn't an exit plan that actually worked. It turns out that this was not the uh, escape hatch I was looking for, you know? In other words, I don't feel well. And you catch it. The relapse protocol that I like to suggest for people who experience relapse, who, who return to a previous level of consciousness and engage, re-engage in a self-harming behavior, I say, look, let's study the experience. Let's study what was leading up to that moment. So I'll say, how about the 72 hours before the relapse? What was going on? Where were you? Who were you with? What were the circumstances? What took place there? What can we learn from what you were experiencing, which brought you to a place where you felt it would be a good decision or a necessary decision for you? to return to a self-harming behavior. Self-harming, not because I say so, but because you have said so. You have said, this behavior in me doesn't work, doesn't lead to a good place. So having come to that conclusion and having returned to that place, we want to really understand what are the circumstances that take place for you, which lead you to a place where you would return to and, and, and experience a relapse of a previously known uh, harmful behavior. People always are able to trace. When I say always, I mean, if you really look back, what you'll notice is at some point, somewhere, I was unable, unwilling, um, something got in the way of me living according to my own truth. 
So that's the thing. We were out of integrity with our heart. We missed something. We were being untruthful to ourself or perhaps to another in some way. And so the signs of relapse, irritability, like extreme impatience, anger, blaming and complaining are behaviors that we can look to when we say, wow, I'm not in the energy of recovery because when I'm in the energy of recovery, I'm not looking to blame somebody for my circumstances. I'm not looking to complain all the time about my circumstances because recovery really indicates something very, very special and very unique in this world. Recovery indicates I now take responsibility for my life. If I'm having a great day, wonderful. I want to understand why. If I'm having a very difficult and challenging day, I want to learn everything I can from that. But that's not an opportunity for me to start blaming somebody. So if I've lost my center and I start blaming, I become resentful. I have a lot of anger. Um, I feel irritable or uncomfortable in my own skin. Or maybe I'm anxious and excitable. These are all indicators that there's something going on in this moment right now that's uncomfortable for me. And I need to look at it. And, and in order to look at it, for me, it requires a few things. Stillness and quiet. I have to calm down for a minute. It's the one thing I was never willing to do in my childhood was to sit still. I never once, never once that I can remember in my childhood sat still to actually consider what I was experiencing in my outwardly, you would have seen a hyperactive child. Uh, inwardly, I was a child that was anxious and concerned and worried and fearful and just not in the habit of just calming down. So you see, developing a practice where you can sit still, and we could call that contemplation or even meditation. Also having a practice of communicating with another person who's on the path. What do I mean by on the path? They too are interested in living their best life, taking full responsibility for the joys and the challenges of their life. They too are on the path of recovery. So I said that recovery was about the, the reestablishing a connection with your authentic self and that to move away from that is to experience the beginning of a relapse or the beginning of challenge. It doesn't necessarily lead to relapse. What, what it leads to, hopefully, is an awareness. I'm uncomfortable. Something needs to be addressed. Let me sit still for a moment, you know, see if I can feel into what's happening here for me. And let me find somebody that I can connect with. So I want to stay on this one point about connection with another. And then we'll come back on and we'll hear from Elizabeth again. If someone were to ask me, what is the single most important teaching in recovery? The single most important teaching that I have to pass on in 31 years of recovery from addiction is to simply not sit alone with the difficult and painful emotions and to be always willing and in the habit of reaching out to share and connect with others, to share the challenge that you're facing with other caring, compassionate, wise people who are also on the same path you are, which is the path of recovery, the path of awareness, the path of discovery, right? There's nothing more complicated. It's just a very simple teaching. Reach out to people who understand and who are willing to look at their own lives, reach out to those people when you're experiencing something that you don't know how to move beyond. That was true for me on day one. It's true for me today, 31 years later, that I, I now I'm a, I'm a yoga teacher and I'm a facilitator of groups like this and 
we have all these things that I'm engaged in, in the realm of recovery. And I can tell you very humbly, you know, from the ground, I can report to you that I still get stuck from time to time in difficulties and challenges that I don't immediately know how to manage or how to move through. What I do know is what to do about that. That I can sit still and I have developed a meditative mind and an ability to inquire within. And that has been a, a, a long practice that has led to only the most incredible things for me. And I recommend that we all embrace meditation and, and practice. That has served me to understand what's going on and what I'm experiencing and my willingness and my humility to be able to reach out to other people who I call friends and teachers when I need help. And not to ever say to myself, I got this. I got this. Especially when I know so clearly from the difficulty that I'm feeling in my body, I don't got this. <laughs> and I'm going to need to reach out to somebody. And so that is the single greatest teaching that I've been given and that I've been willing to live by. And it has served me these years that I haven't had to relapse into uh, drug addiction, alcoholism, cigarette addiction, uh, codependent, all, all the addictions. And, and I'm still a work in progress and I work on it each day. Final thing about relapse. Um, some people think relapse is inevitable when you when you recover from an addiction. And I, I want to be really clear that that is not true. I have had relapses in early recovery. And I have known many people who have not had relapses. So I, what I want to say is, it's something that happens for some of us. And uh, as I've mentioned, the greatest thing we can do is learn from the experience and then tell somebody about it and get right back on track, get right back on track. In a more yogic and consciousness way, I would say that to elevate oneself, one's consciousness into recovery, like anytime we elevate ourselves into a, a new way of thinking that's more healthful and more in alignment, more powerful, there's often a fluctuation where we sometimes we will drop back down. We elevate, we drop back down. We'll elevate, we drop back down. But what if we stay the course and we stay on the path and we keep doing the work and we keep going to our meetings and connecting with people and doing the work of understanding ourselves and working out our, our attachment to the past, which is referred to as trauma and, and resentment and working that out so that we can become fully present. If we keep doing that work, eventually we will crystallize at a new level of consciousness. We will crystallize ourselves in recovery. And what used to be a fluctuation back into an old way of thinking or behaving, that goes away. But now we're, we're at a higher level of healing, and now we're faced with different challenges as human beings. And no matter what level we reach, we have new joys and new challenges to face. And that's been my experience along the path of recovery. So, Elizabeth, let me know uh, what comes up for you, if anything, uh, in this discussion of, of relapse. Well, thank you, Tommy, for that very thorough answer. Uh, my own my own lived experience is when I'm out of integrity, that's a step towards relapse. So that was uh, my own lived experience. But the the thing that really uh, impressed me here was my addiction, addictive behaviors, and some boogeyman that's out to get me that I have I have I have no way to grapple with, right? Which is kind of where part of me goes. Uh, so for a long time, there were no tools. I get into recovery, I'm like, there's tools? <laughs> I got, I got by with my wits for a long time. So uh, all of a sudden, there's tools. So you're saying, oh, yes, there's tools. And so I just think that's really important um, because I feel like, oh, the universe has my back in so many ways. Yes. So thank uh, you for your answer. Well, thank you. I, let's talk about the boogeyman for a minute. Um, because he's a, a figure that comes up in our stories and in our lore uh, mm -hmm. across time. And so uh, the boogeyman is really all about uh, a story. And it's really easy to understand how a human being who has been stuck in addiction feels a sense of powerlessness 
for you have literally been at the, it seems and feels as if you have been at the mercy of something beyond your control. And so that's, I think, where the boogeyman essentially comes from, this, this thing that's out to get me. Um, and I think the, the superstition of the boogeyman can be perpetuated uh, in certain ways of thinking, uh, even amongst people in recovery. So I don't agree. Obviously, I don't agree with everything I hear in recovery. And I think it's important for us to not agree with everything we hear and to really run it through the test of our personal experience. For me, with addiction and with all the challenges of humanity, uh, whether those challenges have to do with relationships or the body, living, dying, getting sick, getting healthy again, all the things, you know, uh, success, failure, uh, loss, grief, all the, all the things that we experience in this life, uh, some of those things are fraught with fear because they're difficult emotions to go through. And, but there's always a story uh, attached to the the emotion that leads to the existence of some boogeyman, which is something that is beyond our our ability to do anything about. And I think there are so many tools, and there are so many realizations ahead for all of us, where that boogeyman, all anyone has ever had to do in the history of humanity, is to turn and face the boogeyman to realize that the boogeyman was never there and that what it was was a story and a set of fears based on experiences that we've had, which led us to, uh, to become cemented into a way of believing and seeing things which no longer served us. But then in turning to face the boogeyman and seeing literally the, the story of that dissolve, one recognized, oh my goodness, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is I'm a person in recovery and I'm in the driver's seat of my life. And the bad news is I'm a person in recovery and I'm in the driver's seat of my life. <laughs> People start to realize, oh my God, I actually participate in my life. I'm actually responsible for the unfolding of my life. I'm responsible for, I participate in the unfolding of reality. That's a big responsibility. And some people don't like to have that. But once you fully embrace that, that boogeyman and that whole concept, that whole uh, archetype of the boogeyman ceases to exist. It goes away. And now you're just here. Imperfectly perfect. A human being on a path of discovery, a path of growth, every one of us, a work in progress. And so it's a beautiful thing to be consciously going down that path. And it's your beats running from the boogeyman and trying to hide from yourself. So thank you so much, Elizabeth, for this inquiry. So much love to you. Grateful, really grateful. 